Hello everyone and welcome back to Dino Class. Today we'll be taking a look at Theropod Arms and a few questions from the community discord. <laughs> One question that I get asked, like, a lot, um, especially by people who just meet me and they find out that I really like dinosaurs, is why does T-Rex have such short arms? And I'd like to start this out the same way I do every time I explain this, by saying that all large theropods have small arms. I mean, lo look at Karka. You see these tiny arms? They're pretty tiny. And, I mean, T-Rex doesn't even have the smallest proportionally in its own family. That goes to Tarbo. And I, I don't mean that to be insulting. We love Tarbosaurus. I love Tarbosaurus. Great, great animal. But it does have the smallest arms proportionate to its own body. Out of the Tyrannosaurs, at least. If we want to start getting into, like, really small arms, then, well, we're going to need to take a look at the Abelosaurs and, well, the Alvarasaurids because, well... Uh, let's be honest here, Alvera swords are just, I, I don't know what's going on with their hands. I mean, like, look, look at this guy's hands. This is from, like, a newly described Alvera sword. What is going on here? Why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not. But... If all large carnivorous theropods are lacking in the arms department, perhaps that says something about the way these large animals lived and how their arms over time became less and less important. And, well, when you take a look at some of these animals, you can kind of see what I'm getting at here. What do T-Rex, Carcharodontosaurus, Giga, and all other large carnivorous theropods that are not Spinosaurids have in common. They got big heads. I mean that, literally. Their, their heads are massive, right? Because, like, we may be used to seeing it like this, right? But just take a look at how big this animal's head is compared to the rest of its body. It's insane. Can you imagine having a head that is half the size of your torso? That's insane! So, what does this mean? Well, Tyrannosaurs and Carcharodontosaurids got these giant heads maybe for different reasons. And we can see that there are differences between the ways that they hunt. One has teeth and skull structure meant for biting and cutting. The other has teeth and a skull structure that suggests it's more built for crushing. But there's one commonality between them, and that's that they're essentially using their heads for the same thing. And that's pretty much everything. Of course, they're using it to hunt down their prey, we know that they're using them to eat, but we also know that their heads are very important for social dynamics. Uh, bite marks on the skulls of tyrannosaurs show that facial biting was a key part in interspecies combat. So over time, the head became the primary way to interact with things for this animal. And as time went on, the arms got used less and less, basically becoming vestigial. But it is important to note that while the arms got smaller and more reduced, certain muscle groups that attached to the head started attaching themselves to the shoulders. Because when you stand like this, the closest muscle group to the muscles in your neck that control where your head goes are your shoulders. It is the next closest anchor point for muscles.
We have a question from the community Discord that I thought very fitting to answer because it has to do with my favorite dinosaur of all time. And if you don't know, my favorite dinosaur of all time is Nanuxaurus hoglundi. Living 73 million years ago in the Prince Creek Formation, Nanuxaurus is my personal favorite dinosaur of all time. So when I got this question from Sapphire Moon in the Discord, I knew I had to answer it. Sapphire asks, Are Nanuxaurus and Eutyranus closely related? Just from images I see of both, I can easily mistake one for another. This is a great question because, as you can see, they do often take on a similar appearance to one another in works of art. So we'll break this down into two parts. How are they related, and why are they depicted so similarly? The first might end up answering the second, so let's get into it. Let's start with a baseline. Eutyranus and Nanuxaurus share a superfamily called the Tyrannosauroidea. Sharing this superfamily does make the two close in relation to one another, relatively speaking, but from there, the two lineages that will give us both animals branch off. Eutyranus appears in the fossil record first, roughly 125 million years ago in the early Cretaceous of what is northern China, specifically the Yixuan Formation. Because of the high elevation of this formation, winter is much colder than normal for Earth in the early Cretaceous. Eutyranus belongs to the family of Proceratosauridae, which, funnily enough, is not close in relation to Ceratosaurus or its family. Nearly 50 million years later, Nanuxaurus appears in the Fockle... Fockle? Really? In northern Alaska. Ala what is wrong with me today? Nearly 50 million years later, Nanuxaurus appears in the fossil record of what is now northern Alaska. Originally thought to be a Gorgosaurus upon the discovery of its lower mandible, later re-evaluation of the mandible showed it was not a Gorgosaurus, and rather an entirely new genus of Tyrannosaur. By the late Cretaceous, winters here in Alaska aren't as cold as today, but still put quite the strain on the local animals. Nanuxaurus is a member of the family Tyrannosauridae, and is closer in relation to the Tyrant King itself. So, Nanuxaurus and Eutyrannus aren't directly related in the sense that one came from the other, but the two are, instead, distant cousins. So why are these two so often depicted similarly? Well. If you were paying attention, you probably noticed that both lived in decently cold areas for their time period. This combined with the fact that Eutyranus has been found with preservations of plumage shows that Eutyranus likely had this plumage for warmth. And if the conditions were right and similar enough, it's likely that Nanuxaurus would have also had plumage, even if we don't have the evidence to show for it just yet. Both are Tyrannosauroids. Both of them likely had feathers, and both ruled over colder areas in their world. So it's no wonder that Nanuxaurus and Eutyranus are forever intertwined, even if they're not as closely related as you would think. So, while the two are not as closely related as you would think, they are within at least the same superfamily, and are kind of like... Very similar looking distant cousins. Kind of like a doppelganger, maybe. With all of that being said and done, thank you everyone for hanging out with me today, and I hope you've learned something today here in Dino Class. Of course, these episodes are absolutely nothing without you guys, so thank you so, so very much for all that you do, leaving likes, comments, subscribing, and all of that good stuff. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your week and a great next week.